You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, pet doctor. where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds, and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance, and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. Because your pet health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. If you've seen the movie Dr. Doolittle more than six times and you've read the series of books All Creatures Great and Small, you probably have pawed at the idea of becoming a veterinarian. What does it take? How many years is veterinary school? What if you love science but hate math? Is there a chance for you? Today's guest is in the midst of becoming a licensed veterinarian. Amber Anderson is a fourth-year veterinary student at Western University in Pomona, California. We'll be right back after this short break and ask Amber, what is it like being a veterinary student? Stay tuned. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Pick up something unique at a Bone to Pick Dog Boutique. A Bone to Pick has cool hip fashions for big and small dogs that will have their tails wagging in style. Cat products too. A-B-O-N-E dash T-O dash P-I-C-K dot com. Check out our eco-friendly pet products and gifts for humans too. A-B-O-N-E dash T-O dash P-I-C-K dot com. Get your pet's mouth watering monthly with our Gourmet Treat of the Month Club. And join a Bone to Pick's free birthday club for your puppy. A-B-O-N-E dash T-O dash P-I-C-K dot com. Pick up something special for your best friend at a bone to pick. A-B-O-N-E dash T-O dash P-I-C-K dot com. Get 10% off with coupon code PETLIFE. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in Paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Want to know what cats like to eat for breakfast? Mice Krispies, of course. Learn everything there is to know about cats on Catitude with your host, Tom Doc. Each week, we'll spotlight a cool cat breed, give up-to-date advice on cat health, and check out spiffy new cat products. So curl up on the couch every week for a perfectly enjoyable time on Catitude. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Almost Anderson, thank you so much for being with us today. I just think this is so much fun because when I went to veterinary school, it was quite a few years ago. So it'll be interesting to see how things have changed or if they've changed. I'm really happy to be here and share the information with your audience. Great. First of all, when did you first become interested in veterinary medicine? 
I was one of those classic students who has been interested in veterinary medicine since the age of five. I always loved um, animals and our dogs and cats and uh, either was going to be a rock star at age four or a veterinarian at age five and I stuck with the veterinary plan. Well, Hannah Montana probably is going to make more money than most veterinarians, but Very I'm glad true. that you stuck with it. Did you ever think of becoming an MD versus a veterinarian? I did. When I ran into a tough time in undergraduate school, I thought, hmm, maybe I should apply to medical school instead. I don't know if I can get into veterinary school, but I went ahead and pursued it and stuck out and went to veterinary school. You said something very interesting right now where you said, okay, here I am going to become a veterinarian, but gee, I'm having a tough time. Maybe I'll become an MD. I think people can be a bit surprised when they learn that getting into veterinary school can really be a bit more uh, difficult than becoming an MD. Could you expand on that one a little bit? That's true. There's only 28 veterinary schools in the United States, while there are numerous human medical schools. And additionally, veterinary schools can only take on average about 100 applicants per class. So looking at these statistics, veterinary school is seen as the more difficult field to be accepted into. I agree with you, Amber, that getting into veterinary school is definitely more difficult than getting into the human medical schools. Also, our patients can never talk to us. So uh, we have a couple different hurdles to climb. And also, we have to learn all the species. So they have to learn just humans, and we do the whole gamut of them. What did you do to prepare yourself in college and pre-veterinary school? What did you do? In high school, I worked for a large animal veterinarian, and I started out actually just filing in the office, nothing to do really with animals, and I worked my way up from there to interacting with the animals and helping the veterinarians. And then uh, I went to undergraduate school at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo as an animal science major in agriculture. And not all people major in the animal sciences. You really can major in anything, but you have to take prerequisite classes in order to get into medical school. What are some of these prerequisites that you have to take in college? These include a biology series, a chemistry series, physics, mathematics, and usually some type of communication class. And you just mentioned mathematics. That was definitely the area that I struggled with. And I couldn't understand why are they making us learn all this math? When am I going to use calculus in veterinary medicine? You know, I'll have my calculator and it'll figure out the drugs that I need. And then I realized that what they're really trying to teach was logic, the logical way to look at a problem and try and solve it. Because I'm sure you can tell us now in your training as a veterinary student, that logic is very important. It is. They're trying to test your logic, but also the pre preparation for the rigorous challenges of veterinary school. They're assuming that if you can get through these classes, that you'll be prepared to go through the rigorous training that we have in school. There are 28 veterinary schools that you mentioned throughout the United States. California is one of the unique ones that actually has two veterinary schools, one up at UC Davis, Northern California, and then Western University that you're attending in Southern California. How did you choose Western? I decided to choose Western because they have a different philosophy. For the first two years, we're not in direct lecture series classes. What we do is we get into small groups, and it's called problem-based learning. So I'm with six other students for the first two years, and they present us with a case or a problem, such as an animal throwing up. And so we have to work through the case and find the anatomy of the GI system, what medicine we would use on this animal, and to figure out how we would treat this animal at the same time learning our basic sciences. And the other thing that they had at this school was a reverence for life philosophy, meaning that all of the animals that we work on um, were not euthanized for our purposes. They all had a, a natural death, um, and they were donated by private citizens to our school. That is marvelous. I know the problem-based learning system is really very different uh, throughout the United States. I think there's only right now, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Amber, I think there's only two veterinary schools that are using that system. Is that correct? That's correct. Cornell is using it as well. 
And it's really very different because I know when I went through veterinary school the first year, you had biochemistry and you had some of the normal systems. And the following year, you had abnormal kidney systems and all the rest of these. And then finally, we tried to put it all together and say, okay, how does this make sense? Where you're really attacking the entire problem from a lot of different angles at one time. By working with your, having your classmates with you, it seems as though you are really much more on the line for self-guiding yourself to get this work done versus somebody looking over your shoulder at all times. Is that correct? It's true. We're not spoon-fed, as they term it. So we, we don't really sit in a lecture classroom and then regurgitate the information. What it truly makes us is problem solvers and then the empowerment of observation of the animal as well. You mentioned that there is a reverence for life at Western University, and that has been an area that a lot of veterinary schools are grappling with because you do need to get your hands on animals and touch live tissue. And I know when I went through school, and this was many years ago, our animals were not survivors. These were pets that they obtained from the shelter that were going to be euthanized, but they gave their lives to us so we could learn how to do surgery. Now, a lot of people think that being able to work on a computer or to have models will work, and that's not always true. What have you learned by working on live animals right now? For for live animals, uh, we didn't really have that experience, and I think the reason that we do have the reverence for life philosophy, too, is because of our location. We're in a large city, so we have the opportunity to have shelter animals come in that we're not going to euthanize, so we go ahead and do spay and neuter procedures on. Um, and we're able to provide vaccination clinics and deworming and interact with these animals um, without having to do anything detrimental to them. However, I don't think that's the case for all colleges, and I don't know that it is always entirely possible. And you're right in the fact that it's really a true gift um, that animals give us and being able to provide their lives for our learning opportunity. I think that you now reaching your fourth year of veterinary school is just great. I was very fortunate to actually have uh, almost Dr. Anderson at my practice uh, earlier this week, and she was there for two days. And because you're going into your fourth year and you've already had surgical training, I was able to observe you do surgery, and you were really pretty good. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, my third year, I went into several different practices and was able to spay and neuter animals. And that's not the typical case for most veterinary students. Um, and I'm really fortunate to be able to have that experience. I agree, because when I left UC Davis, and again, this was a while ago, I had all this wonderful learning in my brain, but my hands didn't really go along with it. So I think my first spade took about three hours, and now it probably is uh, half an hour, if that long. So, yes, practice does make perfect. In the three years that are now under your belt at Western University Veterinary School, can you kind of give us a rundown of what you've done each year? Sure, and this is kind of, uh, relatively typical. It's different because we do have the problem-based learning style, but in most colleges, they have two-phase program, which is a preclinical program, which is where you learn in the first two years your basic anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, and microbiology. And a lot of that time is spent in the classroom or laboratory, or for us, it was spent in problem-based learning groups working out cases together. And then the second phase, which most people enter in their fourth year, and we were fortunate to enter in our third year, is a clinical rotation year. And this essentially, we learn the principles of medicine and surgery uh, through a hands-on clinical experience. Then we apply our knowledge in a clinical setting under supervision from veterinarians such as yourself. And uh, in the clinics, we're able to treat animals, perform surgery, and the most important part, which is to interact with the clients. Now, you're saying your clinical rotations. Western University is also a little bit different than most veterinary schools. At UC Davis, for instance, we would have our veterinary medical teaching hospital right there on the property. Tell us how your clinical rotations are varying. We do have a small hospital on the property. However, it's used mainly for the first and second year students. 
for the third-year students, they, again, begin their clinical year a year early, and they are sent out into local clinics. We're really fortunate that we're in the Los Angeles area, and so we can do this. So local practitioners take on our students in groups of three in their third year, and they all work together in the clinic and get to have the experience there. For our fourth year, we have one month long rotations, and we have two rotations we have to have in medicine and surgery, but otherwise the rotations are up to our choosing for a total of eight throughout the year. And I definitely want to touch on those activities for your senior year because you have some really exciting ones coming up. But first, we're going to take this short little break, and we'll be right back with Dr. Almost, Amber Anderson from Western Veterinary College. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Fluff your feathers, roll out your tongue, shine your fins, snap on your leashes, and grab your human. It's the Louisville Pet Lovers Expo. Two full days of pet-tastic fun that no pet lover should miss. Join us for shopping, the Barks and Couture Fashion Show, Dream Pet Wedding, Ultimate Pet Makeover, Pet Communicator, Rescue Me Pet Adoption, Service Dog Demonstration, and tons of fun contests. Bring your pets and join us at the Louisville Pet Lovers Expo, Saturday, September 27th, and Sunday, September September 28th at the Kentucky Expo Center. For more information, go to LouisvillePetExpo.com. When you're looking to add a pet into your life, consider adopting a homeless animal from your local shelter or rescue group. Whether you want a kitten, puppy, or a more mature pet, a purebred or a one-of-a-kind mixed breed, even a rabbit or hamster, your shelter has the best selection of animals anywhere, all screened for good health and behavior. PetLifeRadio.com presents Take Me Home with your host, Susan Daffron. Join us each week as we showcase wonderful pets, tell stories, and even throw some pet education into the mix. So get ready to find out why the pet adoption option can be a great way to add a furry companion into your life. Take me home every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and will see you now. Amber, you told me that you have some great activities planned for your senior year. Tell us a little bit about them. I do. I'm very fortunate. I have some uh, basic emergency and critical care and small animal some surgery, some internal medicine, and I'm also fortunate to be able to work with the public health department. And then some really exciting rotations uh, include the world-famous San Diego Zoo and SeaWorld San Diego. People would kill for having that ability to do that because you're going to be behind the scenes, hands-on, seeing these animals, working with them. In between my junior and senior year at Davis, I was very fortunate to be able to go to the Los Angeles Zoo, and it was just fantastic. Every day was something new, something different to see, having no idea how you treated an aardvark, but you know you learned about it, and that is just fantastic for you. You mentioned public health. Why are veterinarians getting involved in public health? There's actually a critical shortage of veterinarians in public health, and we're really trying to encourage veterinarians to go into this area. Uh, Veterinarians work with zoonotic diseases in these areas, which is diseases that are transmitted between animals and humans. Examples would be rabies, salmonella, the bird flu. And public health veterinarians also work in food safety and disaster preparedness. And many of these doctors work for government or international organizations. 
when we had the spinach scare here in the United States, um, I think it was last year, and right now the salmonella outbreak that is still ongoing. I know that it has been veterinarians getting involved in this. They found for the spinach that it was actually wild pigs that were defecating in the spinach fields that were contaminating the spinach. So here it was CSI, veterinarians along with MDs and other public health officials that were getting involved in trying to protect human health. I always love telling people about the ways that veterinarians have uh, really moved together with MDs. There is an initiative called the One Health, One World, One Medicine Initiative, and this is the AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association, along with the American Medical Association and the Centers for Disease Control, all together coming together to try to promote the fact that veterinarians need to work with MDs to protect humans, animals, and the environment. So you mentioned at one time to me that you were actually thinking or you are going to be getting a master's in public health. Is that correct? I am. Fortunately, our university has a joint program with the University of Minnesota where our students can obtain a master's in public health. And so we have several students that are doing this, and hopefully that's going to help with the current shortage. The other area that we are short in as veterinarians is large animal. And these are animal uh, veterinarians who work with cattle, pigs, and sheep, and poultry. And these doctors also help to safeguard the food supply in the agriculture industry. Now, at Western University, are you getting any large animal experience, or is this basically companion animal medicine? We are actually acquiring a lot of large animal experience. For two weeks, we went to Central California, and we worked with the dairy large animal veterinarians there. And then for two weeks, we worked in the University of Nebraska for the meat animals that were there. So you are really having a lot of challenges by having to travel a lot. So hopefully you're really good at packing now because it seems like for your clinical rotations and for your food animal rotations, you're doing a bit of traveling. That is the one thing with our school is that most schools that students stay on campus. In our school, we are traveling significantly. So basically this year I had a suitcase packed in my car and was ready to go. What have been some of the other big challenges for you so far in veterinary school? Um, I think the most difficult thing is the lack of sleep. We work (laughs) long, hard hours, and we're very busy, which means you kind of have um, wanting to take a nap often. And I think that I've had to persevere through some of the harder subjects. Uh, Anatomy was a little bit difficult for me, but I worked really hard in it, and it turned out well. Very good. And I know you're doing something a little bit different also because you want other people to know what's it like, you know, kind of a reality check in veterinary school that you've started a blog. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's located at www.almostdoctoramber.com. And on there, I'm going to be blogging about my fourth year as a veterinary student. People can ask me any questions that they have, and we'll talk about pets some as well. I think that's great because oftentimes people want to know a little bit more and they don't really know where to go, so your blog is a good spot. Another really good area to go to is www.avma.org, and that's the American Veterinary Medical Association. And on their homepage, there is a link to one of the videos they have on careers in veterinary medicine. And it really is eye-opening that it's... Yes, you do have to have your prerequisites. You don't have to have a straight A average to get into veterinary school. Oftentimes, like Amber, you were saying, having that uh, experience as you did with equine and then also with companion animals, all that put together, they're looking for the complete package. Some also, um, another alternative other than the 28 veterinary schools here in the United States, there are accredited colleges um, outside of the United States that American students can attend. For instance, Ross University, and that's in the Caribbean. Those students will spend, I believe it's the first three years on campus there and then come to the United States to one of our veterinary colleges here and have their last year here on uh, U.S. soil. So there's a lot of ways of which you can get your degree in veterinary medicine. Amber, when you finish that fourth year, what are your plans? What do you want to do? I may possibly be doing an internship in small animal medicine, and then I also have the public health component, 
And then I hope to be working in media and communication such as yourself. Well, I see I have someone that I can hand off that gauntlet to when that time comes. I think it's just wonderful. You're getting great experience, seeing a lot of different ways of doing medicine because somewhat like um, the analogy baking a cake, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. You want to see what works best for you, and Western University really is giving you that opportunity. Anything else you need to tell us about, Amber, that you think is really important for us, the listeners, to know? Um, I also wanted to address if you have uh, older listeners who maybe are considering veterinary school, you don't have to do it, you know, just as a youngster in your 20. We have several people in our class who were formerly business people, artists, or worked in other animal fields who have now decided to attend veterinary school. So if you're truly passionate about being a veterinarian, you shouldn't let your age or anything else discourage you. That's great. I just actually heard about... uh, Two veterinarians that just graduated from UC Davis. It's kind of an interesting thing. I don't think there's any other similarity in the entire history of veterinary medicine, at least here in the U.S. One of our classmates, my classmates, um, he passed away several years ago, very tragically. His wife, now widow, and his daughter both decided they wanted to become veterinarians. They applied together. They got in together. I don't know if they lived together for the four years because I don't know if I could handle my mom for four years Mm -hmm. under those stressful situations. But they both got their degree in veterinary medicine, and they're going to go out in the world. So I think that is just really kind of fun. And you're right. Age does not need to be something that holds you back. A lot of people are going into this um, as a second career. That's very true. And then also in veterinary school, I wanted to tell your listeners that there is the ability to travel and do international medicine. I was very fortunate after my first year of veterinary school to fly to South Africa to work with their wildlife. And we helped the veterinarians who darted and immobilized elephants, lions, rhinos, and giraffes. And all these animal animals were in the wild, open land. So before you got off the truck, you really wanted to make sure that they were asleep and didn't have any buddies lurking around before you worked with them. I hear about all these experiences that you've had, and my jaw drops, and I am just so envious because you have just done amazing things, things that are so different that most people have never had an opportunity to do, veterinarian or non-veterinarian. Dr. Almost Amber Anderson, you are just amazing. I hope other people listening right now realize they too can really enter an exciting, fulfilling career. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, where can they go again, Amber, to access your blog? It's almostdramber.com. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I just also wanted to let people know that right now, Amber was telling us ways of preparing for veterinary school. There's also ways that you can help prepare your animals for summer. Summer is a time that we all enjoy. It's so much fun to get out there and have your dog, you know, running alongside of you, playing at the beach or going for a hike. But we really need to be careful with these kids because it's so easy for our dogs to have actual heat stroke also known as heat prostration. It actually affects thousands of dogs every summer. Since dogs can't sweat like you and I can, they pant to get rid of that extra heat. But if you're out there on your bike and you're just having a good old time, your dog is trying to keep up with you, so you really need to stay aware of what its limitations are. Normal dog temperature is higher than ours, 101 to 102 and a half. But if you take your dog's temperature and find that it's 106 or higher, that's definitely a medical emergency. We know that temperatures, when they reach 110, that can be fatal in just moments. Older dogs, chubby dogs, dogs with short noses like bulldogs are definitely at a higher risk for heat stroke, so you need to be extra careful with them. If you find that your dog has been out there exercising with you and now is having a hard time standing, seems a little bit uh, rocky on its feet and maybe has some very thick, ropey saliva, that's an indication. It may be having a problem. Get it to someplace nice and cool. Cool it down by putting cool water 
over its limbs. Let it drink some water. But great idea, once you seem to have it a little bit stabilized, get it into your veterinarian immediately. It is a problem. It can be fatal. Cats can also get heat stroke. It's usually not as common because they're not out there chasing balls and having a good time with us. But it's a problem if they're in some area where they can't get into a cool area or if you have a Persian cat, a fat cat, those kitties can all get hot. So best thing to do is watch your kitties closely, your dogs also. They can have sunburn. They can have heat stroke. They can even have burnt little paws from standing on hot asphalt. People often ask me, how do you know if it's too hot for these pets to be out there? Simple answer, get out there, take your shoes off, stand on the asphalt. If you can't stand on it, neither your pets. So thank you very much, Amber, for being with us today. Thank you, listeners, for taking a listen. The goal of this show is always to educate and entertain and make you the best pet owner that you can be, or this way, maybe the best veterinarian that you can be. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with more on The Pet Doctor on PetLifeRadio.com. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. Because they're a member of the family, keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. On demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>